God is going to just be grateful. Thank you, sir. To ensure the salvation of his church. Particularly, this last church. I noticed in the scripture <coughs> regarding Jesus' life, most information written about Jesus is written about the end of his time on earth. And believe it or not, most information written to the church focuses on the church's last days on the earth. That's the term that needs to be updated. Last days. In Acts chapter 2, Peter referred to the writings of Joel, who said, in the last days, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. If you read the whole prophecy, prophecy of Joel goes beyond the church age. But we officially say that on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, that was the beginning, officially, of the last days. That was way back in AD 31, we're in 2012. If the last days began back there, how much more so are we in the last days 2,000 years almost later. We're there. There's a scripture before I read the text in John. As you know, this is all live and unrehearsed. Turn to 1 Corinthians, chapter 10. church. A mistake happened with the first church called the church of the wilderness. Things they did. He warns the church here in chapter 10 not to do the same thing. Longer brother. I would not that you should be ignorant. That could be taken as a text all by itself. How that all our fathers were under the, under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all eat the same spiritual meat. And they all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. I preach. Against this animal document three times. Once saved, always saved. Tell that group of 600,000. They'll tell you it's not true. They were not just overthrown. Warmness. It says in verse number nine, or verse eight, twenty-three thousand fell in one day. Verse nine says they were destroyed. It's harsh word. 
destroyed of serpents. Verse 10 says, and they were destroyed of the destroyer. Go back under verse 6. Tells the whole reason for their experience. Now these things were our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. God gives a year and a half messages. Well, all year and a half. A covetousness. Which embraces more than just lusting after something evil. But it takes in the will. I. Me. And mine. Every time that congregation complained to God, they complained from a personal standpoint. What I don't want. What I want. Me, me. My, mine. They complained to such a degree that they said we're sick and tired of this manna. They represented the word of God. They asked for flesh. This puts a whole different spin on blessed and prosperous. So they asked for flesh. So God caused a strong wind to blow and blew down quail into their camp. Well, my understanding of measurements is correct. The quail is up to their knees. So they're going out, grabbing quail, Barbecue and quail, frying quail, well, well. having a good time. It's like they were truly blessed in the Lord. It says the wild, the flesh was between their teeth, ere the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. I tell you, I news with the last day's church the same way. Mm -hmm. As they're calling on God for what they want, and God brings it down in abundance, don't get it wrong, think that God is okay with it. He's blessing folks right into hell these days. He said, those who I, whom I love, he said to the last, the last church, he said, those who I, whom I love, I'm going to rebuke and chase them. He's going to make life a little tough for you. And those who don't look like his are his, and those who look blessed aren't. All right, you heard that first here, okay? Need to be idolaters, as for some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Jesus never promised blessing, by the way. This is one of those subjects. He promised the cross. So if any man be my disciple, then deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And the cross is not a picnic. It's an emblem of suffering. It's an emblem of hardship. And that's all he promised on this side of eternity. He promised you a cross. In association with him, the blessings come over there. It's not here. The blessings here are spiritual blessings, spiritual prosperity, but that's another subject. Neither of us commit fornication. That's some of them committed. And fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, or destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye. As some of them also murmured, they were destroyed of the destroyer. Now here's the key verse. Now all these things happened to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world are come. Well, that needs to be correct a little bit. It doesn't say the ends of the world are come. Oh, that's not wrong, actually, at all. But more accurately, for whom the end of the age have come. And he refers to it as the ends of the age. Is that correct? I read it wrong. Ends. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. We look for the first rapture date. Back in 1011, 97. That was the end. And then God extended it. Now this, this scripture is actually fully fulfilled. They have come ends. You say, well, that's a real nice way of saying if you're wrong, do not be wrong. It's not it at all. What did God say in his word? He said, I'm not slack. That's what my promises. But I'm long-suffering, willing that none should perish. And so he did what? 
he extended the time. And extended the time. We, we can look back on Noah's event. God said his days, man's days should be 120 years. God had a fixed time for the flood. But who knows how many flood messages Noah preached? Because he didn't tell Noah that. He told us that for the record. He said, we told Noah to go out and preach to the rain, to come and Noah could have preached today, more than likely. And nobody got stayed. And God extended it, and I went into some periods, and Noah preached another day, and another day. After a while, it didn't matter because God said, Noah then built a house, built an ark for the saving of his own house. He didn't build a great big boat in case somebody wanted to get saved later on. Noah built a boat big enough to sleep eight people. That was his own family. Trust me, he that shall come, will come, will not tarry. But this is the end of the age, and we're about to meet the Lord. And now it's more pertinent than ever to understand what God is saying, to know a true message from a false message. So let's go to the text now. In 1 John. My dad will say, I preached already. <laughs> We could do an offering on just go home, but some of you the driver an hour and a half to get here. We'll be upset with me, so we'll extend it, okay, church? So I'll, I'll preach a little longer. I know too many congregations. We have people that drive in from San Diego. Where y'all stay? Temecula? That's a long ways, okay? Palmdale, San Bernardino. I mean, that's the testimony to the love for the Word of God to see a, a full congregation on a Sunday when it's raining. Yeah. <laughs> Give yourself a hand clap. <laughs> First time forward. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. I think there's a reason for that. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. They've escalated. There have always been false prophets around. They're around the Old Testament days. The false prophets, for the most part, were local. They were disguised. They were pretty much covert. In these last days, false prophets have come out. He says, gone out to the world. A prominent preacher in New York. There were night. I had respect him. Because Reverend Knight came around and said it. He said, I'm not, looking, I'm, looking for, I'm not looking for a pie in the sky by and by. I want mine right here, right now. Now that philosophy goes against what Jesus preached. But at least he came out and said at point blank that, you know, I'm, 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 I'm about the money. Mm -hmm. I'm after the money, that's, that's what I'm after, and that's all I'm after, and he was straight out with it. He says, hereby know ye the spirit, O oh God, what you have, what he gives here, and the writer reminding him, writing again is, is John. He was the oldest apostle. He's the only one who lived to, to see a natural a natural death, although he lived the last years out of his life on a volcanic island named Patmos. But he's saying here that he gives a, a new definition. For false prophets. He said, what was the old definition? Real simple. They asked Moses, how can we tell a false prophet from a true prophet? Moses said, if a prophet speaks something in the name of the Lord, and it doesn't happen, don't fear that prophet. If we read between the lines, he's telling you you should fear a false prophet. Because a false prophet has power with God. You should fear not the prophet himself, 
But fear the fact that he works for God and speaking God's word, and that demands a fear and respect all by itself. But again, that's another message. The new, new definition is, what does it say here? Let's read it. Oh, the Bible calls me the right page. Hereby, know me. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to change this the name of this gospel. This book is called uh, the book of Know Ye. Right? It says Know Ye so many times. Right? Hereby, know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come to flesh is of God. Now, oh, this is the message right here. Okay, so lock in. Every spirit that confesses Jesus is coming the flesh. Now, just what exactly does that mean? Does that mean every spirit that confesses that you know Jesus was born one time and he lived and walked on the earth is a true a true prophet? Not at all. When every spirit that confesses that Jesus come to flesh doesn't understand where did he come from? That's important. Answer is what? Heaven. He said himself, he said, I am from above. You're from beneath. He came down from heaven. He came down from heaven then. That makes him divine. Exactly. Absolutely, he's divine. There's one prominent group that goes around knocking people's doors, carrying magazine. Next time they come knocking your door, ask them, do you believe Jesus is divine? Mm -hmm. They're going to tell you no. Right? Anybody who confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh or he's not divine, that's a false prophet and a false ministry. Mm -hmm. And don't open your door and say, God bless you on the way, because then you're encouraging what they're doing. Right. Right. So when the apostle says in the book, he says, don't wish them God's speed, because then you're encouraging them on doing something that they shouldn't be doing in the first place. Okay? And if God is not using the name Jehovah anymore. He's doing business with a whole different name these days. His DBA name is what? Jesus. Jesus. That's one. It got quiet here. Maybe I hit somebody. Yeah. Maybe it's your family. Right. <laughs> let's, let's explore this a bit more. A lot of people are deceived when they turn on TV or radio and hear a preacher talking about Jesus. If you're there for that's a true preacher. A preacher can talk about Jesus every single Sunday and never talk about him. That's right. So the false prophet does. Here's how it goes. Turn your cheek on today, turn your radio on today, this is exactly what I'm talking about. A lot of preaching on what Jesus did. How Jesus did it. You go to a Christian bookstore today, most of the shelves are lined with how-to books. There's more how-to Christianity today than there has ever been. And Christianity is not a how-to affair, but that's what's been reduced to. They talk about why Jesus did so and so. I mean, they talk about you can preach whole message on these, on, on these particular examples. They preach about when Jesus did it. Whole sermons. And none of those ever address who Jesus is. It tells us everybody who confesses that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that means he came from heaven, he's divine, what's no wish with Jesus? Who? They're not preaching the who Jesus, they're preaching the false message. And that's the New Testament definition of a false prophet, is somebody who's not preaching who he is. I watch these awards programs. Sometimes when they get their award, they thank God for their award. And Christians just, they just love to see that. Hate to break their bubble. But to thank God for your award isn't saying nothing wrong. That's right. Now you say, I thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for helping me to attain this. Then you're saying something. 
because that's the confession. When he went to trial, the chief priest, Caiaphas, asked him one question, art thou the Christ? What's he asking him? Who are you? Who are you? He took the higher court, the Pilate's court. What did Pilate say? Are you king of the Jews? Are you the Christ? When they took him to the cross and put him on the cross, Pilate, as it was the custom then, wrote a card to put over the cross to depict the crime of a person. His card said, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. What does that mean? The whole card talked about who he was. I didn't care about the what, or how, the when, the why, and all that kind of stuff, but preaching on TV, preaching this Jesus all the time, and ignoring the real one. Mm. And that's the subtle difference. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come to flesh, to preach this Jesus is not preaching the Christ that came in the flesh. And the false prophets subtle. And they have large audiences. And they deceive many people because they're reading from the Bible and talking about Jesus. How else would Satan sell a false message? Right. But over a pulpit from a book, this God's book, with a character named Jesus, but sell this Jesus the wrong way. There's no, the Word has no power with Jesus. The Word embraces Jesus. You know that? Yeah. He's embraced even in colleges and universities where God's not taught. Here's how they see him. Jesus was a good man. They had no idea what they're saying to make that statement. There's a man that came to Jesus in Jesus' day and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What did Jesus say? Why? Cause I make good. There is none good but God only. Him, him. Jesus is going to call me good, take all away, take all out, and call me God. And that's what the world will not do. A world deceived by false prophets, have you? They'll call him a good man. They give him a false accolade. Religious founder. As if Jesus came on the earth to start Christianity. No, he didn't. No. He never preached Christianity. What did he preach? Himself. 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 He preached me. What other religious founder ever come along and preached themselves? Buddhists I gotta find a way. The work for me. I recommend to you. Confucius came preaching the way that he found that worked for him. Jesus said what? I am the way. Come unto me. That's the big difference. Nobody else made a claim to die for anybody's sins. But Jesus the rest of them recognized sins. They recognize us as being imperfect people who keep on trying to get it right. We reach a higher state and we keep doing better and better and better. We have to go around a few times to get it right. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll die in your sins. Whole different thing. And so anybody who's not preaching Jesus from that perspective and with that focus is a false prophet. Amen. And so from what I said, I think you see it very easily, the television and the radio is full of false prophets. Yeah. God's hoping to be I'm talking about some elaborate, elaborate sermons. There's a lot of good sermonizers mm -hmm. preaching about Jesus. And they get finished, they never talk about Jesus. Imagine that. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whom you have heard. We can make that. So let's wrap this up now. I think I got a point across. The spirit got a point across. Let's go one more, one more thing here. I was mentioning this yesterday. How in the Old Testament, when God rehearsed their experience in Mount Sinai, he said, you heard a voice. And saw, I'd say, paraphrasing, no face. When God first spoke to Israel from Mount Sinai, he terrified them. Said the mountain was on a smoke and smoking, a 
thick black darkness, a cloud came over the mountain. There were thunderings and lightnings. There was the sound of a trumpet. Somebody had blown a trumpet, they never took a breath. One long note kept getting louder and louder until it was deafening until they couldn't hear each other. Well, this is the point. I don't want you to hear each other. When you come to church, you shouldn't have to hear each other. When you come to church, you should be trained on one thing, that's to hear the trumpet or the voice of God. Amen. He got his point across, but they saw no face. For the same God that took on flesh, it says in as John says his gospel, he said in the word, the word in the beginning was word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. When he put on flesh, why did he go from this posture in the Old Testament to now he's going to sit down and post the pictures? There are no yeah. cameras back then. Yeah. And the person has the credit for painting his picture, lived 300 years after Jesus died. Yeah. So he just painted the picture and said, this is Jesus. This is my debt to you. I just paint a picture of you, who, who, who never met you, and paint your picture, and put it in your house. Then you come and visit them one day, and they say, oh, I'm going to get that I got your picture on the wall. <laughs> you look at it, and, you, know, you, you look like me, and the picture has you looking white, with blue eyes, and long hair and thing. And I said, oh, that's not me. You know, said, oh, that, no, that's, that's you. That, that, that's, that's your. And, and try to convince them that, that that's me. After a while, I'm good talking to that person. So, okay, they should be in the nut house, and just leave them alone, because they're up, you know, they got their own little trip going. Okay? Yeah. That's how everybody should be treated who has what they call his picture up in his house. But I'll give you a clue. When the Antichrist comes, he's going to look just like that picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Satan's been setting up for a long time, and he knows, he knows the Antichrist is going to look like already. And so he put a mean image up there to the whole world of Jesus, and that's how the Antichrist is going to appear as Jesus to make his message and his form and his appearance. He's the swab. Amen. He's a deceiver. <coughs> Don't fall for the yoke. Alright? The grace of God. When we thank you, God, for your truth. We pray, oh God, this apostle said, Lord, evermore give us this bread, this bread of truth, O oh God. This is my comfort in your face, us but you. We pray, oh God, these words will continue to sustain us in the days ahead, as the last days close upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.